let's start by defining a little bit of what we mean when we say uh, generative AI. So recently, AI systems have been able to generate interesting things. Uh, that includes images. So there, are, there have been a lot of um, very interesting developments in AI image generation the last six months, maybe. Uh, that uh, the vast majority of people have now have access to. Uh, so this is both in like you know creative fields, but also it's in design and architecture and um, people have been using these, even though they've only been publicly accessible for a few months, um, to really stretch their imagination um, and imagine these these interesting um, ideas and, and places. One of the first uh, th applications here that really captured my uh, excitement um, is this series of prompts to one AI image generation model that says, okay, uh, this is a still of Kermit the Frog in Star Wars and the model generates an image like this just from that text alone. Uh, and this is a model that was not trained on specifically on movies or on on Muppets, uh, but it, that it's able to you know capture a little bit of the essence of the frog and how it would look in the world of of Star Wars um, was a little mind blowing to me. I'm going to be honest. Uh, this is another one where it also put um, Kermit the Frog in the Matrix. Um, so you can see how it captures just the lighting, the aesthetic, uh, just the dramatic cyberpunk um, aesthetic. Um, Blade Runner is even more like neon and, and cyberpunk. Um, but also if you give it the name of a uh, anime, it will you know put the frog in uh, spirited away in this case. Uh, it's already been, you know, winning awards for um, uh, art shows, um, but it's already gone beyond just this idea of, you know, fun projects or fun tools uh, to becoming this new industry. Um, so a lot of the momentum around the term generative AI comes from articles like this from venture capital funds uh, that are describing this um industry that's that's coming out of uh using these um capabilities of uh software uh, that were manifested by uh, artificial intelligence um a lot of these articles have images like this that show you a lot of new products that are trying to innovate on top of this um generative ai theme quote unquote um, you can see some some of them are like entire new industries uh, of copywriting companies, for example, um, whether that be marketing or just general writing or or, or or others. So you can see you can see text in the blue here, but you can have these other uh, image generation, code generation, um, speech, and uh, these are called uh, different modalities. Um, and you can see a lot of um, companies and products uh, popping up um, around these types of um, services and technologies. So if I'm to uh, maybe summarize the two main um, components of what we would call a generative AI at this, uh, at this time, um, it would be text generation models. So these are these large GPT uh, models. Um, that are able to generate uh, text that is very coherent. Um, and we can shape the input uh, prompts for them to, you know, create some rather useful outputs. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. And then we also uh, lump image generation uh, under that. Uh, you can already do some very interesting things with uh, text generation. You can uh, brainstorm with these models. You can have them uh, give you just ideas. Uh, if, so if you're afraid of a, if you're a creator and you're afraid of a blank canvas, uh, these models are really great, um, you know, uh, writing aids. That's how I use them uh, a lot, but they 
also can help with a lot of uh, specific use cases. So if you're interested in summarization uh, or rewriting or copywriting, um, they can do all of these and more. So um, I used to use boxes. Uh, we'll be drawing a few figures of what generation models and uh, look like. So let's actually use generative AI to uh, inform what kinds of uh, figures we paint. So when I say uh, text generation model, I'm going to start to paint them like this. And this was you know, made by an um, AI image generation uh, model. And uh, we can also use, generate another one for you know, image generation models. So let's um, use the tools that we'll be talking about here to just, I don't know, brand some of the concepts. Um, so when we talk about generative AI at this time, it's mostly the commonly available tools for text generation and image generation. There's a lot of research on, let's say video, uh, generation. There's a lot of ideas on can you generate music uh, and other types, but you know that hasn't. We'll see more and more of that, I think, in the future. But that hasn't uh, uh, been, let's say, accessible to to to, to the common person yet. Um, so I work at at Cohere, which is working to make NLP part of every developer's toolkit. Uh, we've been featured in in a number of these uh, lists and. The main idea is that Cohere trains these large language models and offer them uh, offers them on the cloud via API. Um, and if you use a managed language model provider, you get all of these benefits um, as just compared to you trying to deploy your own uh, model and trying to figure out uh, serving and monitoring. And, uh, uh, and so that's a little bit of a, high level you know overview of this um, uh, of what we do and text generation is one of the two families uh, of of NLP models that that we work with at Cohere and we've been uh, working with developers and companies the last um, couple of years to uh, help them use these models to solve real world problems and so we've seen a lot of you know use of uh, text generation and how um, to think about deploying them and using them, what kinds of use cases. Uh, and that's what informs a lot of um, uh, this talk here. And we can infer a bunch of these um, lessons and, and extrapolate to image generation and other types of um, generative AI that, that are coming down um, the pipe in the future. So generative AI is impressive is was the first section. And I'm sure you've already come across things that impressed you about generative AI. Uh, and one of the challenges is that, yes, it can be impressive, but it's not yet reliably impressive. So it will not, uh, it's not ready for you to put in front of a uh, live use case where every output of the model is served to an end user, for example. Um, uh, so there are, certain scenarios of you know where the models work best uh, and what sort of workflows um, they're most um, they're best uh, fit for. Uh, we'll talk about a few of them here. Um, and so this challenge of reliability um, is evidenced by some website like Stack Overflow banning um, GPT generated answers. Uh, from uh, from the the website as answers because it's harmful to the website and because the text is very uh, typically looks uh, good and very readable and coherent but the actual answer uh, is on average in incorrect and so that's a little bit of a challenge uh, that ironically comes from us creating better and better and better models. Um, that, you know, we need them not just to be really good at coherent text, but then we start to have this expectation of, okay, are they trustworthy? Are they factual? Um, so that reliability is, is, is one thing that we need to think about when we think about generative AI. Another sort of uh, aspect of this is, this is one of the first, um, let's say, tweets or applications that really blew my mind about a model like GPT-3, which is uh, this demo where you describe a 
website and the model generates the code for you to build that website. Um, and it's a, a really impressive example. Uh, it probably works some of the time. Uh, so the keyword here is that it works. It's nearly perfectly. Um, so this tweet was in, you know, maybe about two and a half years ago. And we still don't really have this technology yet. So, and this is something you'll come across with, you know, every technology cycle um, uh, where, you know, it will work for some use cases and we think, okay, it's nearly there, but it might take a little bit more time. Um, and this is from a quote for, for, for Bill Gates, where it's like, a uh, technology, you know, we tend to um, overestimate how a technology will change the world in one or two years, but then we underestimate what actually uh, changes, um, ends up changing in the future. Um, and so that reliability, I think, is is um, is one area where we as an industry are, are working um, to not only build better models, but also inform users about the best ways to um, use these models. So to really uh, safely and responsibly and, and properly uh, use um, AI and, and generative AI, we need a bunch of things. So we need proper playbooks of you know how to deploy them and where to deploy them and what to look out for and, and how to evaluate. These are all research areas that are continuing to be um, developed. And there are ideas about you know how can we ground them? How can we have them um, give them better access to information, to um, even tools? So that's another sort of uh, theme. Um, to talk about language models uh, a little bit, there are these models that are trained to have language skills. Um, and that's really the one thing that they're trained um, to do. And their training is basically that we get a lot of text and we use that text to generate examples um, to train the model. So, you know, we get all of Wikipedia, we take a sentence of, let's say, five words from Wikipedia. We give the model four of these words and we hide the fifth. And we say, okay, predict what the fifth word would be. Uh, and then it would give us a prediction and that prediction would be wrong. And we'll say, no, you predicted this word. That is not the right answer. This is the right answer. This is the difference between them. And so we update the model to be better at predicting the next word. And then do this over millions and millions of time over a large enough data set uh, and for a language model that is large enough. And that's how you create a large uh, GPT model that acquires language skills. But then on top of that, we also found that if the model is large enough and the data set is also large enough, uh, the model learns things beyond language. So it also learns a lot of world information and it learns uh, some reasoning skills that are really surprising in how they sort of emerge just from this language modeling task. Not complete reasoning, but you know some steps of reasoning that it's able to do. Um, and so a few of the ideas we'll 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 uh, touch on um, here are you know concepts for how to use these models more effectively to get better results. Ideas like prompt engineering, like multi generation. Uh, like using these models for data augmentation. Um, also, we'll be talking about you know a couple of interesting integrations of you know how not to think about a language a language model as just one thing that you give an input to and get an output out of. Uh, it's useful to think about it as a component or a pipeline, as one component in a pipeline uh, of a of a more intelligent language AI system. So we can think of a language model as this thing that we, it has an input prompt and then it, it uh, gives you an output. Uh, but if you're thinking about using it as a component to solve problems, uh, you shouldn't restrict yourself to the one output that the model generates. Uh, there are a lot of use cases that are improved if you have the model actually generate multiple outputs. Um, and then these outputs can be, you know, we can select one of them, or we can pass them through a human that rejects a few, approves one, maybe edits one, um, and that is sort of serves as um, you know one 
way to roll out these these models and get sort of um, better results. And there are ways to you know automate um, uh, some of these. Uh, so there are measures of you know choosing the best output from amongst the five that the model generated, and that would tend to give results better than if you just have the model generate one output and you choose that one. Uh, we have this uh, video by Dr. Rachel Tetman that uh, you can find on, on the Cohere YouTube channel that uh, demonstrates some of this idea about how to use uh, generative uh, language models to build chatbots faster. Um, and the idea here is how to use them to augment uh, data and to use them to generate training data. And that's one area where these models are, are, are very interesting. They're, uh, these are two uh, works uh, that are um, exciting that use large language models to generate uh, training and synthetic data that create better search systems. So the method on the left is called uh, GenQ, and the one on the right is called inParse. Um, and there are many other research areas of you know how to use a generative model to generate data that you know makes other uh, systems be them be they search or even classification or other types of even generation models better. Um, and to touch a little bit on one of these methods, um, you know, how can it improve a search system by, uh, you know, if you're building a search engine for a series for, a, you know, an archive of documents, you can have the model, you can present it with a prompt like this, uh, where you have an, the text of the document and then you generate questions about this. Uh, document and that would give you um, synthetic data that is going to be very useful for you to create a better a neural search or semantic search system. The other concept that is sort of emerging as a new key uh, programming uh, paradigm is this idea of prompt engineering, which is how do you shape the input prompt to have the model do useful things for you? Um, and this is not just for text generation models, but this is also for um, image generation models. You have to be creative in how, what keywords do you put in um, and uh, how you use the, the input prompt and how you use language to um, nudge the model one way or another in, in what it creates and what it outputs. But for text, um, Models, we have this, uh, you, you can search for our prompt engineering guide. Um, if you're working with a generative language model, like one of the easiest prompts to give it is to give it a long article and say, in summary, and then the model would you know, know that you're trying to generate a summary out of this uh, and it would generate um, uh, a summary. And so this is maybe generation number one this is the first, let's say, batch of um, uh, language models or generative language models. More and more, you start to see this other paradigm of instruct or command where you say, you give the model the article and say, summarize this article. And so this is one way where how this um, prompt engineering is, is, is evolving as people sort of learn how to um, better interact or have preferences about how they interact with the model and what they intend to uh, do with the model. A lot of the times providing examples of what you want the model to do uh, is, is, is beneficial. So if you uh, issue a command to a model and it doesn't do what you do, what you want it, uh, getting, uh, giving it a couple of examples um, tends to be useful and nudges it in the right way. That's another sort of a useful uh, trick for uh, prompt engineering. Uh, a very useful prompt pattern is the list where you say, this is a list of X and then give it a couple of examples and bullet points. And then you, you leave the third or fourth bullet, bullet point uh, empty and the model uh, generates this. I use this all the time. It's, it's, it's super useful. Uh, that's a bunch of prompt engineering for text models. If you're working with uh, AI image generation models, you know, different models are, are prompted in a diff in different ways. Um, but the, there are these ideas of, okay, do you want an illustration or a photo? Um, do you want a vector graphic? These are all useful keywords to put in, in the prompt. And if you want, let's say a picture of a person, 
Uh, do you want it to be a close up? Do you want it to be a medium shot? Do you want it to be a long shot? Um, these are all keywords that are that were relevant in the training of the model, and they can uh, nudge the AI image generation model to um, generate more of of what you want to see. Uh, another very important idea, and I think it's going to be very important this year, is this idea of retrieval augmented language models, and this is where a language model is able to access information uh, beyond what is stored inside of it. Um, and so this is where you give a language model the ability to access a search engine and search for results or access to a database where it can pull up some information. And this is uh, a very favorable thing to do for many reasons. So one is that it's kind of inefficient for you to store all of that information, all of the world's information inside of uh, the parameters of a la large language model, and you have to, you know, deploy all of that to GPU memory. When we have perfectly good database um, uh, systems and um, software that can sort of deal with all of that. Um, another thing is that if everything if everything is stored in the model, you cannot really update the information of the model without retraining the model or training it some more. Uh, so you have these cutoff dates where the model doesn't know anything beyond this specific year. While if the model actually had access to a, an external knowledge source, a, a database, or uh, the web, you can update that information um, or shift it. Maybe sometimes you want to create a model that does not talk about our world. Maybe you wanted to talk about, uh, you know, a specific fictional world where you're building a, a, a chatbot that you know, uh, talk to you, talk to you about trivia for, you know, a specific fantasy world, for example. So there are use cases where you want more control about what information the model can, can access. But also one of the pitfalls of people interacting with language models is expecting them to be able to generate facts. Uh, and that's another area where these uh, retrieval augmented models uh, excel. They can tell you, this is the fact and i think that because of this page or this uh source that it cites uh, and so that's another sort of a really important idea that comes comes from that and then it's useful to as we talk not to just think about the model as one thing that you input to and get an output out of um you can think about it more as a system where a language model is only one piece in that pipeline um, and so we have you know, an example system here for answering questions where the model doesn't just answer the question right away. It actually goes and searches the web, gets the results from the web, puts that into a part of a prompt, and then generates the answer. And we have a full write-up about, about this um, system, and we've open sourced um, as part of what we call the Cohere Sandbox um, uh, program. So you can... Um, we have this Discord bot. You can ask it any questions. We'll go search the web, give you the answer, and also cite to you where it found it. Uh, and we welcome people to build on top of this and sort of um, make it their own. This blog post goes into exactly how that model, uh, how that system works. And my final point is that generative AI, the term, uh, is you know doesn't even uh, cover uh, the half of it. So. Uh, AI empowers really interesting use cases in search, and that is not really a generative um, capacity. And so when we only talk about generative AI, we're not addressing one of the most or some of the most interesting areas because search is one of them. But then you also have multimodal, uh, let's say, uh, image understanding models. Uh, so these are image captioning models, and I give them this icon uh, based on these two that we've we've generated um, previously. Um, and these models have been developing in, a, in, in very interesting ways. Uh, so we had models like this from 2015, but then we have later models that you're able to actually have dialogue for and you point them to, um, this is a very interesting model um, from DeepMind called uh, Flamingo, uh, where you give it a picture, it, give you, it gives you a caption, but you can also have this dialogue um, with the model. And you can use that dialogue to guide the model's attention to uh, things that are difficult for models um, typically to uh, focus on. So things like, you know, practical jokes um, or, you know, how many people are in the, in the picture without counting the people that appear in the mirror, for example. Um, a lot of this is based on this 
a, a blog post by Andre Karpathy 10 years ago that where he said, this image makes him depressed about AI uh, because the technology at that time was not able to understand these subtleties. And, you know, we see really quickly 10 years on, the technology is catching. So this is a, a very quick look at generative AI, what it is, how it's impressive, and how it's not reliably impressive yet, and how we need to develop these, these playbooks. We need to think about how we ground these models for them to give us better um, uh, results. Um, and then just on terminology, the word, you know, the term generative AI doesn't even capture um, everything that is exciting about the world of, uh, of AI. Um, thank you so much for listening. You can uh, find Cohere on this uh, on Cohere.ai. We welcome you to join our Discord community. We have a lot of discussions about NLP, and we're all, all always excited um, to work with people who are building the next generation of uh, language understanding and language generation um, systems. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much.